wheels of this road will then seem as nothing as we sweep through the beautiful gate farther
the fire being the gospel that come down as a split tongues, if you will, and then the wind. And when you mix wind and fire, you get something that's uncontrollable. So the Spirit of God represents the wind. When the wind with the gospel of God, the fire starts, it's uncontrollable. Uncontrollable. It'll burn down fields. It'll move. It doesn't discriminate. When the Spirit of God, the wind is mixed with the fire of God, the gospel and it's through the servant of God, it's uncontrollable. It gets out of hand. Maybe think when's the last time it got out of hand in your life. So the only way you can quench a fire, I, I preach Wednesday night, number one is to cover it up. That's when you and I shut our mouths. The gospel doesn't go no matter how much spirit and wind you've got without fire, without the gospel. If it's covered, it can't burn. It can't move. Another way to fight a fire, to put out a fire, is especially a forest fire, is to start another fire here and let it consume itself. Thus, when we as the church of God begins to fight among ourselves and have internal conflict and that fire begins to burn, it'll burn out when we have these internal conflicts. When we're more concerned what's on social media than we are about lost souls in our community, we burn out. And then, obviously, you've got to have the wind, the with the Spirit. Peter said you'd be filled with the Holy Spirit. So there has to be wind. That filling is based on obedience. Without a filling, the fire don't go out. So that's pretty simple of the gospel. Now Peter stands up after the Holy Spirit is, has fallen and he's going to preach an apologetic sermon which all you guys have missed because if you look there in Bible times, the service started at 9 a.m., the third hour. So the 9 o'clock group are all on board. I don't know what's wrong with you guys, but Peter preached at 9 a.m. That should be the standard of the church, right? But at 9 o'clock, uh, Peter stood up and preached the third hour and said, man, these guys are not drunk, and we're going to get into exactly how he preached. So I want you to bear with me because this is not my style, and it's extremely, um, for me to keep it interesting, for me to understand it, then I have to, it's just a lot of mental <laughs> thought process that goes on here. But I want to make sure, and the only reason I, it's what God's laid on my heart is is to simply preach a defense for the gospel this morning. Before we do that, we're going to pick up in Acts chapter 2. I'm just going to read uh, one verse. That, that way, uh, it's the verse that I think many of us, Acts chapter 2, verse 41. While, we're, while you're turning there, Acts chapter 2, verse uh, 41, <coughs> uh, John Collins. Uh, which is uh, Mikey Joe, uh, obviously grandson. There he is. Uh, just got a message while ago. Uh, remember uh, Lindsay and John Michael. Uh, look, I mean, just a precious. This is this man. This just fires me up when you get a text. Uh, hey, he's having a little. He come a little early uh, by C-section Wednesday, and uh, he's having a little trouble breathing, and they had a little tear in his lungs, a little hole in his lungs, and then we just started praying. Lindsay and John Michael texted me, and then by the next day he said, hey. X-ray showed everything has sealed up, and actually we just got a text this morning. He's in a, actually off the uh, ventilator and everything, actually in a, in a room or a crib by himself. Yeah, he's moved uh, He's moved out of a uh, NICU in a crib, so uh, we're uh, praying a couple days uh, he can come home. But, man, it's just that kind of stuff to be able to I promise. If you'll send me your prayer request, it doesn't bother I stop, I pause, and I pray immediately when I get those. If you, if you don't, you, you're going to forget. So I've learned through the years, somebody sends me one, you will not bother me by sending me, but I can keep up with you, and I can pray, and especially when I walk the pews, I see where you're sitting, I see your faces, and I recall what you've sent me that week, and some of it's unspoken, some of it's a pray, some of it is a pray. We've had uh, Julie Clark's grandmother uh, pass this week. We had, uh, many of you may be acquainted, if you're acquainted with, New, uh, with Hills Chapel, had a teacher there that passed this week, and so there was a lot going on in our church family. I preached a uh, funeral last Saturday night. It's just a lot of stuff going on, and so I can keep up with you, and I, I pray. I promise I pray, and it's just, uh, man, I, I want to keep uh, that going on. With with prayer, I've been praying about Labor Day and us having an old-fashioned uh, baptism. Uh, I did talk to Bill. Uh, this is how God works. I said, God, you just open doors. Bay Springs is closed. I don't want to go to somebody's lake and say, hey, we're going to have 200 people come over your house during a pandemic, so, uh, but we got to have restrooms, and so I, I thought of the Bree Loves Lake, and sure enough, I walked to the barbershop every Thursday there, COVID boy, got to get that haircut every Thursday, and see, God knew that, and so Thursday morning, Bill Bree Loves sitting in the other barber chair when I walked in, I'm like, this is too good to be true, I said, let me ask you something, hey, I said, do you think we could use your lake, he said, yeah, 
So I said, we'll call your preacher and see if we can have a joint service. I called uh, Brother David last night and said, hey, this is what our plans are. We'll have an old-fashioned service at the Bree Loves Lake and just the band have set up ball game tents and singing and then preaching and then baptism, baptizing the lake. He's like, we'd love to be there. He said, what are y'all doing for lunch? I said, well, I was just going to get some drinks, you know, and have a 10 o'clock service. He said, how about I bring a cooker and we cook some chicken? I'm thinking, hey, this is, this is working out really nice, especially for a chicken guy, you know, a preacher, right? This chicken's going to be, oh, and so uh, he was excited about it. We talked, man, we talked on the phone for about 10, 15 minutes, and so uh, Candler Chapel's going to come join us. That'll be Labor Day weekend. Uh, things are, anyway, things are going good there. We'll rent some Porta Johns and some uh, Porta uh, what, sanitizing stations. And what they, man, you know you can rent, like, bathrooms now, like water, everything, right? And so uh, we'll, we'll have things set up like that. Uh, that'll be over there. There's plenty of parking. You can get as socially distanced as you want. Uh, I'm looking forward to that in Labor Day. So it's a little bit of what's going on in our church. This Wednesday night, we have a meeting with those that uh, uh, that are planning to know of people. Right now, I think we've got about 25 to 30 kids that are interested in coming here after school when school starts in September. Uh, we're going to offer about 3 to 5.30 uh, a program that basically they come in. Uh, try to do their homework for them, try to get them fed for you, and then try to teach them a little bit of Bible. And then we've got the cage out, I'm sorry, we got the fence out here. So we got kids getting play outside or in the gym if it's raining. Uh, so we'll start our after school uh, program, I guess you'd say, uh, when school starts five days a week. But we've got a lot of interest in that. And uh, so that we'll be meeting on that Wednesday. So if you have friends or family that's looking for someone, uh, there is going to be a charge there. It'll be about half of what, uh, you know, the going rate is, I guess. That'll be the ministry of the church or the mission of the church. The thing we're looking at right now is getting Internet because all these kids now have uh, Chromebooks. I nearly said iPads. So uh, that's our next challenge is to get Internet here so that we can do their uh, their homework for them. So if you know somebody be interested, hey, uh, there'll be uh, four or five people here at night working. There is going to be a fee because we'll actually pay those workers to pay for the snacks, uh, but the, it's not a profit. We're not trying to make a bunch of money. We're trying to break even every week, if you will. And so that's sort of how that will work. If you stand with me in honor of reading God's Word, let's pick up here Acts chapter 2, verse 41. I want you to remember this number. Remember this number. Then they <clears throat> that gladly received His Word were baptized, and the same day they were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Remember that. Those that received the word gladly and were baptized. The same day were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Father, thank you for your words. Now I pray, God, you'd begin to uh, move in this place, God. You'd begin to stir your spirit. I pray, Father, like never before, you'd use me, God. Give me, the, God, the uh, unction, God. Give me the words, Father, that I need. God, you know the hearts of all men. You know who's sitting here, God. You know exactly, God. The words that would penetrate a hard heart, the words that would penetrate a bitter heart, the words that would penetrate a cold heart. I pray, God, for revival among your people, Father. I pray, God, if there's someone here that don't know you today, I pray, God, someone that's just walked, walked God, they've walked and sat in a church pew, but, God, they've never surrendered their life. I pray today, Father, through the preaching of your word, your Holy Spirit begins to move. And today, God, they'd surrender their life, God. They'd be born again, Father. That revival would break out among your people. Now, God, just use your words, God, the way, God, you intended it to be. Get me out of the way, Father, I do pray. Forgive me where I failed you. In Jesus' name I pray, and all of us said, amen and amen. Thank you, you may be seated. So, we've got Peter that stands up in the day of Pentecost. Now, you recall these boys at Jerusalem. So, he's preaching in Jerusalem, and he's preaching to devout, uh, devout Jews. So, right here in Jerusalem, he's not out in the suburbs of Galilee. He's not out here in Marietta. He's right in the middle of Main Street, Jerusalem. He stands up and he begins to preach the day of Pentecost. The very first thing, what is the catalyst for it? You've got 120 men that were filled with the Spirit of God. I preached that Wednesday night where they go out and they begin to flood the streets and they begin to proclaim the gospel. And people are like, man, it's a miracle. What's going on? These people are speaking. These, these uh, old country boys from Galilee are now preaching and they're speaking in tongues in different dialects of language. And everybody here can understand how in the world can this be possible? And some naysayer says, I tell you how it's possible. These boys are drunk. It's just a, a bunch of gibberish, if you will. These boys are drunk. And then Peter stands up and says, no, these boys are not drunk. And he begins to proclaim the first message at 9 a.m. on the day of Pentecost. He begins to proclaim what's happening. And so now Peter knows the audience. These are Jews. He knows we're in the middle of Jerusalem, devout Jews, 
So he's going to have to take what they know and apply it in a defense of the gospel. It's apologetic uh, preaching, and he starts with Scripture. So the first thing we've got to do here, this is what Peter does. He lets the Scriptures come alive. Look in verse 17. I'm going to preach through chapter 2. You keep your Bible open if you, read, if you, if you keep notes, just to keep your pen handy because we're going to go through all chapter 2. Look at verse 17. And it shall come to pass in the, in the last days, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, your old men shall see dream, dreams. If you look at verse 16, the Bible says, But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. I had a hard time with this. Why in the world will Peter pick Joel? Why not Jeremiah? Why not Elijah? Why Joel, if you will? And so I began to think, if you recall in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus also shared the same scripture of Joel. But the more I got studying Joel uh, through this week, I noticed that Joel, his ministry was in Jerusalem. He was a prophet from Jerusalem. That's where, in other words, he would have taught in the synagogue. He would have taught right here where Peter's at. He's basically saying, oh, let's take your preacher. Let's take who you put your faith in. You say that your prophet Joel wouldn't lie. Well, I'm telling you, what you're seeing before your eyes is what Joel said. Joel said in those coming days that he would pour out his spirit. In other words, you would receive the gift of the Holy Ghost and it would be upon your daughters and your sons, each and every one. Now, Joel is predicting the last day or the, the great and terrible day of the Lord. It starts with the coming of the Holy Spirit. It ends in the great tribulation. So what Peter is saying, you are seeing with your own eyes what you put your faith in is the prophet Joel. You're seeing it come alive. I begin to think of that gift. And Peter is saying it's the gift of the Holy Ghost. God begin to remind me, what is the gift of the Holy Ghost? What is the spirit of the Holy Ghost? Well, what he's saying is, is look around these men. You want to know why they have courage? You know why they're not afraid to speak? You know why they're preaching the Messiah? It's because they have been filled with the Holy Ghost. How do you know you've been filled with the Holy Ghost? Well, when you have the Holy Ghost, it, you receive the spirit of truth, so you, then you can't be deceived. You receive the spirit of faith, so that you can't have, you can't be discouraged. You receive the spirit of grace, so you can't be discouraged. You receive the spirit of holiness so you can't be defiled. You receive the spirit of wisdom, therefore you ought not be dumb. You receive the spirit of power so you can't be defeated. You receive the power of love so there's no discordant. You receive the, the sound mind through the Holy Ghost so that you should not be disturbed, disturbed, especially in a pandemic. You receive the spirit of life so that anything around you, everything that looks at you, anything that smells in any way should never smell of death, look of death, or even appear to be dead because you have the spirit of life in you. You receive the spirit of glory because you should not have, you should not be disdained. Every characteristic of the Holy Spirit or characteristics of the Lord Jesus manifested in his humanity whom the Holy Spirit has poured out of me. The reason these men are not discouraged, the reason these men are not defeated is because they have life and they're standing up to devout Jews and saying, you crucified the Messiah. His name is Jesus, and I have given my life to him, and I have been filled with the Spirit of God, just like your prophet said would happen. Wow. It's got your attention, hasn't it? You trust your prophet, don't you? Your word says a prophet don't lie. But you're going to believe your prophet Joel that taught here, that preached here, that penned his words here in Jerusalem, then you'd have to believe him. We scratched our head for a minute. This is the next person Peter brought up. How about King David? He's your king. He built the temple. His son did. You trust him? What did David say? Oh, boy, this is good. I don't know about you, but this is going to get really good. Look, look David... He, he quotes, Peter quotes Psalm 16 and 132. But I'm going to read there in verse 25. For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he's on my right hand. That's, that's, that's key. He's on my right hand. That I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice and my tongue was glad. Moreover also my flesh shall rest in hope, because thou will not leave my soul in hell, neither will thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make full the joy of thy countenance. 
Men and brethren, let, this is Peter, let me uh, freely speak unto you of your patriarch, of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his grave or sepulcher is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn an oath to him that the fruit of his loins, in other words, his bloodline, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, and his soul was not left in hell, neither did his flesh see corruption. What in the world are they saying? They said, hey, you hang your hat on your prophet Joel, and Joel said that the Holy Spirit Spirit would come and would be poured out. You are witnessing this. You hang your hat on David and you hang your hat on the Psalms and you hang your hat on King David. It, when you read Psalm 16, David said that his grave, in other words, the grave would be empty and that the man would see no sin. It can't be David because if you look over there, hey, we're sitting here in Jerusalem. Look at the Mount of Olives. There's David's grave and his bones are in the grave. So David can't talk about himself. What David was talking about is the one you crucified, the one that's sitting on the right hand of the Father and go to his grave. Fifty days ago, you put him in the grave. Where is his body? It's not there because the grave couldn't hold him just like your King David said. And you're putting your faith in David? Would you believe David? Then you got to believe that he's talking about Jesus. And boy, scratching your head now. You believe Joel? Joel says God's spirit would be poured out. That's what you're witnessing. You believe David? David said there'd be one come out of his bloodline that would be the Messiah. The grave wouldn't be able to hold him and he'd see no sin. A sinless man you crucified. And now I can go right over there and show you David's grave even until this day. But you can't find and show me the bones of Christ. He's not there. So David couldn't have been talking about himself, even though you say that. He had to be talking about the Messiah. Now he's got them. He's taking what they're putting their hat on, and he's using it and defending the gospel. Pretty soon, he's basically making the Bible come alive. So then he gets to witnesses. Verse 32, God's word says, This Jesus hath God raised up. Here it is. Key word, got to highlight this. We are witnesses. So he's talking to devout Jews who, man, the prophets and the law is our Bible, if you will. So, pop quiz. Let me find somebody that's sleeping. I'm just kidding. My wife is up here. <laughs> pop quiz. How many witnesses, according to the law, that the Jews were absolutely, this was the law, did it take for something to be a fact? Moses penned in Deuteronomy, how many witnesses would it take for something to be a fact? Two. If you have two witnesses, then it's a fact, period. you got to have two witnesses. Here it is. One witness shall not rise up against a man for a sin or any sin, any sin that sinneth at the mouth, here it is, two witnesses, or at the mouth of three witnesses, shall the matter be established. It's a fact. Two witnesses or three witnesses. Peter says, your own law says two or three. Now Peter's he knows the law too. He was a devout Jew at one time. There's 120 of us. Ooh, 120 divided by three would be 40, right? The number of completion. There's 120 witnesses. Your law says two or three, and it's an established fact. We are witnesses, 120 of us, that Jesus was crucified, resurrected, and he has been with us for 40 days, and then he ascended on high. We are witnesses to that fact. There's more than two of us. By your own law, you say it's an established fact if two or three agree on the same thing. Now watch carefully. Could you see Peter saying, how many witnesses did you have when you crucified Christ? you got to have two for it to be an established fact. How many witnesses did they have when they crucified Christ? 
just to jog your memory, this is my favorite part. I mean, this is where those investigative skills come in where you like, man, you just want to get in your Bible. This is it. And you can find it in Mark chapter 14. And the chief priest and all the council sought for witnesses against Jesus to put him to death and found none. How many we had to have? Two or three. And the chief priests and all the council sought for witnesses against Jesus to put him to death and found none. For many bear false witnesses against him, watch this, but their witnesses agreed not together. Hmm. And there arose a certain and bear false witness against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and within three days I'll build another without his hands. Ah, oh, look at verse 59. But neither so did their witnesses agree together. We can't find two that have the same record that make it a fact to crucify Christ. Watch carefully. Look at verse 61. Or verse 60. And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, saying, Answer you nothing what these witnesses have against you? But he held his peace and answered nothing. Again the high priest asked him and said to him, Art thou the Christ, the Son of the blessed? In verse 62. Watch carefully. And Jesus said, I am, and you shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of the power, coming in the clouds of heaven. And then God, God's word says, and the high priest were in his clothes and says, we don't need further witnesses. And they begin to shout and crucify him. And Peter looks at them and says, Jesus repeated what David said, that he would sit on the right hand of glory, and you crucified him. So either Jesus was wrong or David was wrong. Which is it? Because all Jesus did was repeat what King David said had said that he would sit at the right hand of the Father. I've got 120 witnesses saying this is established. You have this many that can agree together. Wow. He's using their prophet. He's using their law. He's using their king to prove of what they're hanging their hat on is false. That they need Jesus. You know what happens when a man begins to admit the truth? Questions come out. What can I do to be saved? What can we do? You proved to me that Jesus was the Messiah, and I was the one that begged for Barabbas. I was the one that shouted crucified. I was one in the crowd that mocked him. Oh, my goodness, what can I do? I blasphemed God. What can I do? I rejected him. What can I do? And Peter says, repent and be baptized. Repent and be baptized. Wow. What can I do? Verse 38, verse 40 tells us what you can do. Peter said to them, be, repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. I've told you what that gift was. For the promise is unto you and to your children, to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God should call. Look at verse 39 again. For the promise is unto you, and your children and everybody sitting at East Marietta this morning, those that are far off from the day. That means you, every one of them. Even as many as our Lord God shall call. What Peter was saying was, let me tell you what you can do. you got to leave your religion behind. You say, what religion? Look at verse 40. And with many other words did he testify in his order, saying, save yourself from this untoward generation. The Greek untoward generation means crooked and perverse. As soon as he said that, remember these are devout Jews that had studied the law, that knew the law, they knew how many witnesses you had to have, they knew all of King David's prophets, they knew the prophet Joel, so what law is he talking about, about the untoward generation? You can find it in Exodus chapter 32. You recall this is the feast of the first fruits, the day of Pentecost. That was established in Exodus, the feast of the first fruits. God said, bring your first fruit. But what happened in Exodus 32? A golden calf. Wow. Let me turn over there. In Exodus chapter number 32, we find a golden calf. Exodus 32, verse number 5 and 6. Turn over there real quick. Exodus 32, verse 5 and 6. Listen to what God's word says. Boy, this gets deep, deep, deep. God's word says, And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. Watch this. They rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings, bought peace offerings, and the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. 
very important. Rose up to play. Hmm. Verse 7, And the Lord said to Moses, Go get thee down, for thy people which thou brought us out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. There's your wayward generation, if you will, untoward generation. Hmm. What are you trying to say, Ray? You've got to leave religion out of it. Well, I, I, don't, I don't understand. All right. So God told the children of Israel he would send angels to lead them, angels that would go before them, angels that would take care of them. Instead, when you open Exodus 32, they say, we want a hey, Moses is gone. He's up on Mount Sinai. We want our own gods that will go before us. And so Aaron said, well, bring your gold. And they began to bring their gold, and they melted down, and they made this calf, if you will, a golden calf. Okay, well, what's the big deal with the golden calf? How it's the same big deal it is with me and you. You see, when you have a religion and you don't have a relationship, there's a golden calf in your life too. Because if you recall, right there in the shadows of a calf, Aaron said, now let's bring an altar, and they placed it before the calf, and they began to make sacrifices, and they began to bring all their treasures and lay out the God on his altar. Friend, let me tell you, when you begin to profane the altar of God, God says you are crooked and perverse, and you need to save yourself from religion. What are you trying to say? I'm saying that we do everything the world does, and we act like the world, and we look like the world, and then we come in here on Sunday morning, and right in the shadows of all our world we're living, right in the shadows of our ball games, right in the shadows of our hobbies, right in the shadows of putting our family before God, right in the shadows of our idol, we come in here and we lay a sacrifice before God as if God is pleased with that. Peter said, save yourself from this perverse generation. Save yourself from your religion. Save yourself from absolutely having God in the middle of a golden calf lifestyle. Say, Ray, I don't understand what you're talking about. Oh, it's simple. If Jesus is not number one in your heart and number one only, friend, you are part of the crooked generation. And I can tell you how you know that, where you put your energy and where you put your passion. If there's anything else above Jesus, it can't be Jesus, and it has to be the Lord God. He is my God and my one and only God. The children of Israel didn't have a problem. They didn't have a problem. We're having a golden calf as long as we come to church on Sunday. As long as we made our offering in time. As long as we were baptized. As long as everybody knew, hey, my marriage is okay. As long as I'm going and fitting in. As long as I'm cooking hamburgers at Vacation Bible School. As long as I'm doing everything else. I mean, God should be happy with me. I'm actually spending some time with Him. In the shadows of my altar. In my adultery see why this hits home with me is because when I was 16 I went to an altar like this Kobe and I knelt down said God I want you to save me I want to be saved but but I can't give up my immoral lifestyle I can't give up my buddies I can't give up my habits so I want you to save me hey so you'll be in my heart but the other side of my heart is going to be with what I want, my flesh. Peter the whole time is shouting, Save yourself from your crooked, whole generation. All right, Bible scholars, let me show you something that you can put in the back of your mind and go, You can't make that up. You can't make that up. I opened this morning by saying, how many souls were saved and baptized the day of Pentecost? How many? How many? 3,000. How many did the children of Levi kill in Exodus 32 for worshiping idols? How many? How many? 3,000. What's God saying? He said, when you hold on to religion, there were 3,000 people over there that I killed because in the shadows of that altar, they lived. The Bible says they played, which is a sexual term. In other words, they took the lifestyle of the Canaanites, and they didn't have a problem living like Canaanites, and they didn't have a problem worshiping God while they lived like Canaanites, and I killed 3,000. But I'm telling you, when you come to me and you repent, I can save 3,000 just like 3,000 perished. 3,000 also was brought to life. To a Jewish scholar, he 
be scratching his head about right now. Wow, I'm hung up on religion. Which brings me to my last thought. You've got to let the impossible become possible. Verse 24, Acts 2. Whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be, that the grave should hold him. I'll translate that for you. It's not possible. So how is this going to be possible? How is this going to be possible? Now, you, again, you've got to understand your audience. Peter said, repent. Get rid of those idols. Die to self. Surrender your life. Be raised up. then be baptized mm. see the word baptized to a Jew would be a flame word Brother Joe because for you to be baptized you would have to denounce your family denounce the prophet denounce King David denounce your culture denounce your heritage you have to give all that up because for a Jew to be baptized would mean he'd have to lower himself and say I'm no better off than a Gentile because the only people that were baptized were Gentile they would get baptized to wash themselves purified so that they could practice Judaism so when you look at a Jew and tell him he's got to be baptized you're telling him you're no better off than a Gentile and if you're going to be born again you've got to repent and be baptized Can you hear the naysayers coming? That ain't going to be possible. Ain't nobody going to do that. Who in the world is going to be baptized like a Gentile? Who in the world is going to... Man, that guy is preaching Gentile. Nobody can do that. That's impossible for a Jew to repent and be baptized. We are the children of God. Abraham is our father. Moses is our father. King David is our father. We are the children of God. I will not stoop and lower myself and do what he's preaching like I'm a Gentile. Hmm. You hear the naysayers this morning in your heart and in your soul saying that's not possible for me to admit I'm wrong. That's not possible. That's not possible for me to somehow publicly tell everybody that I'm a living a lie. You hear those naysayers? You hear those naysayers in your mind? You see, it's impossible. It's what the devil's telling you. And it's what he told the crowd. But I started the message with a key point. How many heard and received and were baptized, Toby? Three thousand. You see, word comes alive. God says when you try to do it your way 3,000 people die. When you do it my way 3,000 people were added to the church. And so the lying question, the elephant in the room is which 3,000 are you on? The 3,000 that's doing it their way? Or the 3,000 that's doing it God's way? 3,000 perished in Exodus 32. 3,000 saved in Acts apologetic preaching just taking what you know having a defense for the gospel you trust Joel he said the Holy Spirit what you're witnessing you trust David he said there's one that the grave can't hold and never met sin and sits at the right hand of the Father you trust your law witness it there's 120 of us what are you putting your faith and trust in you trust in your religion 32 Deuteronomy 32 I'm sorry Exodus 32 3,000 healed Acts 2 3,000 saved you're saying it's impossible the devil's telling you it's impossible right now you just gotta admit that you're wrong swallow your pride you see for a Jew to be baptized he'd have to humble himself and then everything Ted 
when you receive the Spirit of God on the inside, it can't help but bubble up to the outside. A preacher buddy of mine said this week, I don't understand how a big, big God can enter the soul of a little, little, little bitty man and not anything come out for the world to see. It's near impossible. But yet we have a lot of people put their faith and trust in, I'm a Christian. I've said a prayer. I've been baptized. But yet they have idols all in their life. And in the shadows of those idols is their service to God. And 3,000 perish. I don't know where you're at today. Hmm. I tried to lay out a case for the gospel. You can understand and I can understand. I don't care how many times you've walked this, down this aisle, how many times you've stood on these pews, how many times you've been in Sunday school, or how many times you've just said a prayer in your mind. It has to be God, God alone in your heart. Nothing else. Throw it out to Him. Repent means to turn from your wicked ways and not go back. So if repentance, you repent with the idea that you, you're not going to stop. It's not repentance. As a matter of fact, God don't even hear it. I don't know where you're at today, but I beg you, don't leave this place without repenting being baptized, as Peter said. Save yourself from this crooked and perverse generation. Pray with me. Father, Lord, I come to you today. I got all I know to do is let you work. You know the hearts of all men as you've showed us. God, my heart to pray and speak. I pray from the back to the front, God. We could hear the words of Peter echoed in our in our hearts and our minds. Save yourself from your religion. Save yourself from your religion. God, I pray today that someone would do that. God, that they would be a multitude. It's the 3,000 that was added to the church here in Acts 2. They'd be a multitude added to the church today. God, they'd receive the gift of the Holy Spirit through repentance, confession. God, I pray revival would break out. God, let us get serious of you. Stop trying to fit in. Stop trying to look like everybody else. God, you called us out. People should see a difference. Let that be my prayer today. Give us boldness. As these men stood up when everybody said they would, said, I'll be baptized. I don't want to perish with this crooked generation. Help us, Father. Help us. In Jesus' name, and all of us say, I mean, would you stand with me? Church, is there... In your altar, is it in the shadows of something else? Oh, repent. I pray you'd come. If you don't know Christ, I pray you'd come. Don't leave this area. I don't care how good of a father or mother you are. I don't care who you know in the community. It's whether or not Jesus lives here. Would you come today? Would you come give your heart to him? I don't, you don't have to know what to do. Just say, hey, I know I want to be saved. Would you come as we sing?
God's people sin. Man, if you have a seat just a second, the open place are at the front, the back. If you feel led to give, uh, you're part of worship. You uh, please do that as you leave. Just a couple things. I challenge you, challenge you, challenge you. I'm praying that, man, God's really excited. Man, just fire me up. I promise your ministry just to be here in your presence fuels my soul. So thank you so much uh, for that. I pray that you will already be praying. This, probably the Saturday after Labor Day, depending on how things are going with our uh, health and stuff, that that will be our outreach day. I'm, we're praying for that. But right now, you should be praying for your neighbor. When you drive by their house, you see them out in the yard, you've got to prepare that path. Pray for your neighbor. Next Saturday, you'll go by and take them a box of donuts and a letter from the church and uh, give to them got to start praying down. Let it burn your heart. That's coming up. Our mission, uh, Christy had a little mission. She sent out to the women. Some of you uh, may have participated in that. You may not even known about it, but we uh, gathered up stuff for uh, uh, the center in Tupelo. So thank you guys for everybody that's involved in that. There's some uh, toiletries and things like that for the guys down there. So uh, a lot of good stuff. At the end of the month, I'll be in Montana uh, with Brother Zach that last weekend of uh, August. So uh, Sonny will be here then. Uh, I love you, church. I think the youth meet 6.30 Wednesday night. I will be live on Facebook Wednesday night. We're going to continue to have these split services. And just, man, I'm so ready to get back to Sunday school and just get running and eating and just having, man, just being part of our family. I miss our family. Uh, anybody have anything before we dismiss this morning? Yes. Uh, so remember a uh, young man uh, passed in a car crash, his family. Highway 30 this week. Uh, I, I get, obviously, I get all the crash information now. So uh, we had a bad wreck yesterday involved some children in Union County. And I, I just pray for those families as soon as they come across my, uh, as soon as the, uh, the MXP sends me that information uh, last night. So, man, just pray. Uh, pray for our folks. Give praise reports. Looking forward. Continue to pray for Mr. Hoyt, Ms. Erlene, those uh, in our church that are not able to come back because of their health. Uh, man, let's just pray and keep our family together until Wednesday night on Facebook. That'll be the last time. Uh, that'll be the next time I see you. And then Sunday, uh, 9.30 and 11. I don't have anything else. Anthony, I'm going to let you uh, declare a benediction. You are at liberty to go. I love you, church. <laughs>